Good morning and happy Thursday, the Ides of October, one and all. I'm Kate Byrne, and I'm the president of Intentional and SOCAP Global. I'm really excited to uh, have the opportunity to have a really informative and interesting conversation uh, around resilience, insurance, and democratization of capital. That's a big mouthful, but that is uh, really the passion and the purpose of today's guest in creating and building her company. I'm joined today by Kate Stillman, who's the CEO and founder of Jumpstart. And we are gonna learn a lot about everything I just said and a little bit more. So without further ado, what I usually do, and many of you who check in, you know the drill. What I'm gonna ask is, would you please post your questions in the chat box? We'll pose them up to Kate after Kate and I have a chance to have a conversation over the next 30 minutes or so. And then we'd also love to know, where are you joining us from? And what would you like to learn? What are some of the stumbling blocks or questions? There's none that are not to go there. Ask anything. As we always say, there's no such thing as a stupid question, especially to me as the daughter of a person who actually sold insurance. <laughs> um, I still think it is one of those topics that so many people are really nervous about. So cast that all aside, come on in and join in the conversation. So Kate, welcome, welcome. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Kate. Really appreciate the opportunity. So tell us a little bit about how you got here. Like what led you here? What's been sort of your journey first as, as a human and as an entrepreneur and as a company builder? Yeah, thank you so much for asking. You know, I think that, um, as you said, my name is Kate Stillwell. And uh, the, the, the point about being a human is really what drives all of us and what forms the purpose for the careers and the journeys uh, of all of us as, as human beings. And so I'll start on that note because when I was um, 18, I had I experienced this uh, setback in my life and I had an opportunity to really dig deep and exhibit resilience at a really quite, quite a young age. And resilience then ended up becoming the theme of the rest of my career. And the specific thing that happened to me is that I was diagnosed with a cancer uh, a form of lymphoma, which is cancer of the immune system called Hodgkin's lymphoma. Mm -hmm. And it was, um, it was shocking um, in my personal life. It was shocking to my parents. It was shocking to know whether or not, um, you know, how I would fare. And coming face to face with the sort of the mortality that we all have. You know, I wasn't in danger of dying immediately, but there was a lot of uncertainty about the treatment and it was scary. And it was, it caused me to have to dig deep into my inner resources. And that led me to really have this um, simpatico with all these, every single human being is faced with a setback at some point in their life. And at some point has to dig deep and tap into those inner resources to be able to be the, the really resilient person that they truly are. So it was, it's really the theme of resilience that has um, characterized my life and my career as well. What are the other areas where, I mean, you've really put it to work. It sounds, I'm sure, you know, running a business right now, one, starting a business, <laughs> but then COVID-19 hits and Shazam, what has that done for you both as a, again, I'm going to focus a little bit in the beginning about you as a, as a person and as a leader, and then the company overall. I mean, has it been, I, I feel like I'm asking the obvious question, but I'm, clearly it's, it's got to have been exhausting. Um, so how has it impacted you? Yeah. So, um, the, you know, I live in California, Berkeley, California, and uh, here the shelter in place mandate has um, been in place in different phases ever since March 13th. Um, and, you know, the, there was a big, there's a, a huge difference in daily life between 
before and after. And a lot of us um, are starved for socialization, are craving the old life because life will never be the same. Um, but at the same time, it has helped, um, you know, again, this is on the personal side, cultivate a sense of gratitude. We have food on the table, our kids are healthy, um, our community is, um, you know, the hospitals are not overwhelmed. Um, the community is doing what it needs to be able to, to be able to cope. And there's so many good things. The, the air in California is clear today after having a month of smoke. And so there's so many things to be grateful for. And I'm just so um, grateful that the uh, opportunity that this pandemic, that this shock um, has inspired more reasons for us to be, um, for me individually and for us as a community and, and within the company as well. Uh, to see the, the the small beauties of life. So, okay. How, what brought you to starting this company particularly? Like, yeah, so. Yeah, tell us, tell us that now you, you've overcome, you've got it just resilience pulsing through your body and your veins. <laughs> and you say, all right, I know, I'm going to start a company. <laughs> Tell me about that leap. That's a big one. Yeah, thanks. It, it wasn't like Athena jumping, you know, popping out of the out of Zeus's <laughs> head at <up> born. <laughs> there, there was actually a progression. <laughs> um, so I did. I started my career as a structural engineer. Uh, so designing the working with architects to design the skeletons of buildings, and in particular, the most. Um, the, the part of structural engineering that had the most appeal to me because of this resilience theme was designing buildings to be safe in earthquakes because earthquakes are dramatic and they're dynamic, the forces are dynamic and when they occur, people die not because of the earth shaking, people die when there are buildings collapsing and how can we bring our talents to bear on building literally physically building resilience into our infrastructure. And so it's a very gratifying career. My heart is still, um, still has strong ties to the structural engineering community. Um, but I was working for about eight years, and now this gives away my age, but that's okay, uh, when <laughs> Hurricane Katrina struck. And I had a professional crisis. I realized, oh my gosh, safe buildings are so important, but they're, they're not sufficient. They're, they're necessary, but not sufficient. There's, um, all these other elements of disaster resilience. And one of the big missing pieces is making sure there's enough money in the system so that people can stay in their homes. One of the things that happened after Hurricane Katrina, um, little known fact, 40% of the residents of New Orleans at that time left and never came back. So the New Orleans population has, has come back um, close to pre-Katrina levels but not all of them with people that used to live there. And so there was a major dislocation of the original residents, some of whom lived there for generations. And so the next big challenge of building resilience is making sure that there's financial equity in making sure that individuals can have enough money to get over the hump, enough money to make the difference between having to flee and, and uproot their families or being able to stay, tough it out for a couple months, help neighbors rebuild and really get a jump start on their recovery process so that the community as a whole can get a jump start on its recovery. Now, that was one of the questions I was gonna ask is, hence the name. Hence jump the start. name. So that's literally really what the name is all about, right? It's helping oh, yes. people get that boost and that lift that they need. Um, and I would think, especially in mentally and emotionally post such a trauma like that, where nothing around you is solid, it's gotta be extraordinarily um, helpful, a godsend as it were, to have some kind of access to capital like that or, and or support beyond just capital. I mean, also, you know, so that's another thing. It's with insurance, it's always a tricky conversation, right? I mean, I know we talked, my father sold life insurance. So there you are talking about someone's, you know, <laughs> pending death. Um, with something like this, how do you gauge in that conversation? How do you, and, and do you find yourself going beyond just a vendor partner and really more um, a steward for somebody's future? and their resilience and their livelihood and, and helping 
be one of the bricks, bricks in their future foundation as they rebuild from what's lost. That, wow, I, you, thank you for saying it that way because you, you said it that. very, very clearly. Um, one of the bricks in the, in the rebuilding of, of, of the foundation of our personal livelihoods. Um, you know, I think that uh, just briefly, I'll touch on the role of insurance um, sort of in the macro economy, which is that um, the, the, the purpose of insurance, it's a hallmark of, of a mature economy because the role it plays is to buffer against financial shocks so that uh, a shock, whether it's the shock of a natural disaster or the shock of the pandemic or, or whatever shock it is, doesn't create this economic spiral um, of debt or of, uh, you know, that, that exacerbates um, the social inequities, the financial inequities that exist. Um, you know, money isn't everything. We need social connections. Desperately, we all know it. We all in the current situation. We realize how much we need those. We need good governance, but money can make the difference. And so, you know, insurance pr provides that buffer against, you know, the, the, against falling into the tipping point. Um, so, and I think I'll just take a moment to explain uh, what Jumpstart does, and, and then and I'll go into answering your question. Um, so, we are um, our product provides an immediate ten thousand dollars after. And a large earthquake. And you use the money for whatever you need. Can you define okay, large? Okay, just real quick, because for those of us in California, I know what I would say is large, but in other parts of the country and other parts of the world, a large earthquake might be different. So what do you, what constitutes large? Is it 5.0, 6.0? Is it referring to damage done? How would you define that? Yeah, thank you for asking. It's based on transparent public data from the US Geological Survey. Um, and it's based on shaking intensity. So mm -hmm. the US Geological Survey publishes these color-coded maps called shake maps of shaking intensity. And everything in the red zone, which is never a perfect circle, sometimes it's blotchy, sometimes it's even multiple circles, even from the same earthquake. Uh, everybody in the red zone qualifies, all of our customers in the red zone qualify for their $10,000 payment. And I should be clear, the Jumpstart product is available at this point in time in California only. So the purpose of the $10,000 is to get over the hump. You know, it, it only pays for a couple months worth of expenses. Um, it doesn't, it's not enough, obviously not enough to rebuild a home, especially in California. Uh, it's just enough to get a jump start. And so the purpose, getting back to your original question, is to reinforce that inner resilience. So for traditional earthquake or any kind of insurance, really, there's this awkward discussion about, okay, um, you have, they have to be, there's this bad thing that could happen. And here's a buffer against, um, you know, exactly. provides you finances in case the bad thing happens. But, you know, having this instant payout reverses that conversation to seeing, to tapping into the inner resilience and being able to say, okay, we all know the bad things can happen, but, and we all feel this sense of resourcefulness. We all do have this inner resilience and here's something that can reinforce and make it you know, the resources, you know, a resource to then allow you to tap into your inner resourcefulness and reinforce how you can make your own future and start over. And so th that's the beauty of this instant payout, what we call parametric insurance, which triggers based on data. Which is terrific because if ever you needed something to literally help you move forward, it's at that moment. <clears throat> because yeah, the last thing anybody wants in the aftermath situation is to be like going back and forth, calculating up their damage, um, trying to find an insurance adjuster. Uh, there's so many other things that we need to be, that we are already going to be focused on. We're going to be sitting there, the earth stops shaking. First thing we do is we look inward. Okay, am I safe? Um, my heart is racing. Um, now, then I look to my family. Okay, is, is everybody okay? We, we're crawling out from under the tables. And then we start looking externally. Okay, lots of things fell off the shelves. Uh, the house is not on fire. The apartment building is not getting flooded. Okay, we're all going to walk slowly outside. And then, they, and then we start seeing, oh, I hear the sirens. And oh, I'm smelling some smoke from across town. And, uh, you know, the, the, we're all in this shocked situation. The last thing we want is to have to worry whether the money is going to come and what is the processing and what is the paperwork that we're going to be able to have to do to get the money. So I have a question for you because something you just said um, struck a chord. So here, I too live in California, here in the Bay Area. 
San Francisco Bay Area. I live up in um, an area called San Rafael. And just recently, everyone knows, listening, that we had these horrific fires. So I found fires to the north, all directions. I, we literally were surrounded. And hello, I live surrounded by eucalyptus trees, which means I'm literally essentially in a fire pit, which is beautiful as long as it doesn't go alight. So a couple of years ago, when Paradise Fires took place, we got a call from our insurance, our home insurance company that said, we're canceling your insurance. And, and I was like, why? And it was because we were 500 miles away from a fire. This is before any of the fires had happened here. So my question, long-winded, is, is, is Jumpstart, is, is this a good product to get for those who have yet, or is it a precaution for those who have yet to experience and kind of are on outskirts of areas that can be hit by, say, in this case, earthquakes? So preemptive? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that um, what I'll say to that is that you live in California. I live in California. A lot of Californians, and especially people first moving into California, they're, they are aware of the earthquake risk. It's not as, it's not as um, tangible as the fire risk, which happens every year, which causes us to smell smoke. But, you know, almost everyone that we talk to is like, oh, yeah, the big one is coming. We believe the big one is coming. Um, but uh, it's like we're 10 months pregnant. That's what they say. Um, but there's no easy first step to get prepared. Either you have to like go whole hog and be a prepper and have, you know, all of your stuff and make sure that all of your food in your pantry is always, um, you know, before the expiration date and, you know, and retrofit your house and you have to really get in this mindset of I'm, I'm really, um, really uh, prepared and strengthened. Um, or you have to ignore it. And, but there's so many people who don't want to ignore it and don't have the time to do, to be a full on prepper um, and want this sort of easy first step to, to, to get prepared in a way that um, costs only on average $20 a month and which is, um, you know, doesn't take too much time and yet provides these, this first layer of support system to get you over the hump. Right. It's a terrific uh, peace of mind right there where it then is, enables the person to just go about their business, just kind of knowing, okay, whatever happens, I'm covered. I don't have to sit there and, and really think hard about this. So shifting gears a little bit here in terms of being a business owner, because we've got some questions that we'll touch base in a couple of, um, a couple of minutes, but around um, running a business, what has been the best part of being your own boss and the best part of starting your own business? Um. <laughs> so many good things about uh, starting a uh, business and um, being the boss, but I'd say that two things really rise to the top. One is um, being able to bring together the best team, the best possible teammates, surrounding myself with people who are smarter, who are more capable um, than I am, and really um, playing off of each other to build something that's greater than any one of us individually can do. And that doesn't just include the employees, that includes the partners that we work with, uh, that includes um, the whole ecosystem of what it takes to run a business. And just being able to be surrounded by this ecosystem that um, is creating great purpose in the world and is leaving the world a better place and being the change that we want to see in the world um, all together and as a group. And I would say that the, um, the second one is really what I just touched on, which is um, being able to live my life's work and to take this theme and make something, make good, make something good in the world. The, make, the process of making, the fact that it's a, a thing, a real thing that's gonna have a real effect on people's lives and that it's for good and that it's going to improve the state of the world and has a, a, a higher purpose in addition to um, a financial purpose. Is it lonely? I mean, you know, we all hear about how it's lonely at the top and it's, I mean, I know for myself, it certainly is. Um, and, and where do you turn? I mean, where do you go to find others? 
other like-minded folks? I mean, well, I should stop and just let you answer the first question. I'm just really curious. Also being a woman in that industry, isn't that industry, are there a lot of women, at least senior women or individual owners of their businesses? Because I would think that's a whole other magnitude and other area of disparity and potential loneliness. Yeah, so I'll say that I think every person has some degree of feeling loneliness. Every person has a unique journey and the founder's journey is no different. There are things that a founder and a business leader um, grapple with that are that, that a majority of other people don't. Um, and that part of it is lonely, but I wouldn't say that overall it's lonely. Um, I think that, you know, as I said, we're surrounded by this, these amazing group of people, both internally and externally. I have an extremely supportive family. I would not have been able to do this without the support of my spouse, my children, my, my parents, my siblings. Um, and that's a huge, the social support and the social connection is a huge element of being able to have the wherewithal to be able to, to buffer against the, the setbacks um, in, in the journey. And then you asked about um, being a woman. You know, I, having come from the engineering world where about 10% of those who, um, you know, advance beyond about five years in their career, only about 10% are women. Um, it's a very collegial environment uh, in spite of the, the, the different proportions. And so I was very used to the uh, being a minority and not, and, you know, not seeing the, not, not, interpreting that as disparity. So there's a big part of that that, you know, once, once I get over, once women get over the, uh, the shock of being in the minority, if finding ways of, of, of wor working with their counterparts um, that are constructive and that respect the differences of both parties, there's so much richness that diversity brings. Um, and, uh, and, and, and I think that's where, that's where I'll leave it. No, I, I understand that. Um, all too well. And I think that's really true. I think it's how one looks at it and approaches it. Um, and in, in many ways, actually suffering is an option. So now speaking of setbacks, what has been the hardest decision you've had to make? And what were your options? And why did you choose to go the way you did? So what was, what, take us through that process and what the thinking that you that you that framework that decision process and or even prioritization process that you put yourself through because that i think is so core for so many entrepreneurs and business owners it's it's learning best practices and getting inspired by those who are in different sectors and i think this is particularly a great opp um, opportunity for folks to learn sure um so i have two different forms of answering that question. One, the first is more a cerebral, a more of an academic answer. Um, and that, that I'll keep that one short, which is um, my decision process in facing, the, facing setbacks is two part. One is, um, you know, combination of analytical and intuitive and not um, ignoring either one of those, making sure that I'm paying attention to the sensations, the feelings, the intuition, and at the same time, not putting all of my weight in that basket, also doing, running the numbers, using the metrics, using the data to inform, to have the best possible piece of information to reduce the most uncertainty. So that's the, that's the cerebral answer, it's the real answer, but now I'll tell, the, I'll tell it in a storytelling way. Um, and uh, I'll just describe one example. Um, this is pretty much the worst thing so far that, that has happened to the company, uh, which was, um, you know, the, sh the first the shock value, I had to, lay off the whole team in one day and save the company through a publicity stunt. And the backstory is we were set to launch our insurance product um, in August of 2017, August 24th of 2017. The date makes a difference. And, uh, you know, the, the payouts for the $10,000 per customer doesn't come from a, a fledgling startup. We are partnered with a reinsurance company, which is uh, reinsurance is insurance for insurance companies. And so the money after the earthquake comes directly from this very large bucket pool of money directly to the customers without Jumpstart. Um, Jumpstart is only the facilitating technology in that portion of it. So we had to have this partnership with this reinsurer. Um, on August 17th, so this is seven days before our, our launch, we had been working 
We've been working together 18 months, shoulder to shoulder, to bring this product to life, to integrate the technology, to make sure that we're both agreed from our legal perspective and a regulatory perspective. August 17th, they called and they said, we changed our mind for whatever reason. You can't do and that. There's no crying <laughs> in baseball. Come on. Well, you know, we had we had an agreement, but we didn't have the next phase of agreement. They changed their mind. It, it was what it was. And uh, we, so we weren't able to launch because we wouldn't have been able to make good on the promise of delivering $10,000 after the earthquake. Um, and so I realized, oh my gosh, it took us more than two years to be able to get to this point. How long will it take to get a different partner? And so I realized we have to go into straight cash conservation mode. I was, had very, eight very difficult conversations all on the same day um, as a surprise, not having prepared, okay, how do, you, how do you lay somebody off in a way that preserves their dignity and tells them you appreciate how much you've done. And, uh, and we, two of them agreed to stay on on an essentially volunteer basis uh, for the next two months so that we could execute our, our last ditch effort. So we have an earthquake simulator. This is a trailer that you tow behind a pickup a truck and it's on hydraulic actuators. Actually the same technology used for low riding cars. And, and it's built by uh, uh, the person who, whose name is, um, 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 uh, I will tell you his name in just a second, but he has the world record in hopping cars. So the, these are full sized cars without a driver in them, the remote control, but full size cars and the wheels have the hydraulic actuator and you get them going and, you, and they're in an arena and you, they hop and they hop and they hop and they bounce. Um, and the world record is 13 foot one inch from the ground to the underside of the wheel. That's like taller than a house. The, the car gets off say, the ground. That's a couple of stories. I mean, that, <laughs> wow. That's um, that's anyway, uh, so he built this, this earthquake simulator for us uh, and he, um, we, so you get inside and you turn it on and it bounces up and down and, and there's a, uh, and you experience an earthquake. Um, so we took the earthquake trailer to a conference called InsureTech Connect. It's an annual conference every year in Las Vegas, although this year it was uh, online and virtual. Uh, so there we were in Caesar's Palace with this big trailer, ka -chunk, ka -chunk, ka -chunk, and hundreds of people came in and experienced an earthquake. They were all taking uh, social media videos, selfies of themselves and posting it. One of the posts was, the best thing about this conference is the Jumpstart Shaker. Aha, you and know who was it from? The innovation lead at the Lloyd Syndicate that we are now working with. And so a partnership was born through Even this, better. but it was effectively a publicity stunt. Um, so this, this sad story, it does have a happy ending, but it was really excruciating to actually go through the experience of it. Oh my gosh. So were you able to hire some of the folks back or have you done that over time? Yes. So um, a couple of the same folks and mostly a new set of teammates. And the name, I, I, I just want to... Um, Give him a, a, a high yeah, five, right. a virtual high five, John Markowitz. John Markowitz, and he's based right. in Bakersfield. So if you have any needs for a low riding car or similar related technology, you give John a call. I've got it. That is a good name to have in your back pocket. <laughs> I will say on um, when, it won't be probably for a few years, but the next time we have SoCap live, I would love to have that simulator there. I think that would be terrific. Oh, really thanks. Not, it's not for everybody. I mean, there's plenty of folks no. who um, have PTSD after earthquakes because they're scary. Yeah. Um, but for those of us for whom it's not as uh, traumatic, um, it's, uh, it's certainly an experience. Oh, my goodness. So um, I've got a, it's interesting that you're talking about the format and the way that the, the business was set up and such. We, I wanted to turn and um, ask you a question that Nikita Prasad, and Nikita, I hope I got your name right, um, was asking, how was your product received by the insurance sector, the regulators, and the incumbents? Great question. So I'll start with the sort of two-part question, regulators and incumbents. I'll start with the uh, regulators. So the um, nine out of 10 Californians forego earthquake insurance. That is... Um, so earthquake insurance is non-mandatory. Um, and what that means is that there's this huge majority 
of the population that is either going to have to rely on their savings or public aid. But savings, a lot of people don't have savings. Mm -hmm. And public aid, FEMA is the first to admit that, uh, that their resources could be too little too late. And so that means that there's a huge opportunity um, to, for, from the insurance perspective, but there's also a huge need and a huge opportunity to, to do good and help fill that gap. There's a big gap. And the regulator knows about this. Um, and in the 2014 inaugural speech of the then insurance commissioner, Dave Jones, his number one priority out of three priorities, his number one was get more Californians protected for earthquakes. Hmm. So when we went, we have a strategy of engage early, engage often with the regulator. We started our regulatory, or we started, earth, we started Jumpstart. We found a Jumpstart on March 1st, 2015. We started selling policies in 2018. But on June 1st, 2015, the very first thing we did is meet with the regulator. And Dave Jones himself was not there at the meeting, but two of his deputy commissioners were there. And the, the most important thing we got out of the meeting is do we have an alignment of values? Do we have an alignment of mission? Do we have an alignment of purpose? And the main purpose, which Dave had already said in his speech was get more Californians protected for earthquake was absolutely right there because that's our purpose as a benefit corporation. Our specific public benefit is increase economic stimulus after a natural disaster. And the way we do so is through this private market product. The more people who are protected, the more, pe the more stimulus there is, the more people who are protected, the more the regulator is doing their job for consumer protection. So that's how the California regulator perceived it. Um, the notion of a parametric product more generally is um, perceived by, generally perceived by regulators as mm, uh, on the fence. On one hand, yes, absolutely. It has the potential, this awesome potential to bring technology to bear on filling insurance gaps and getting more money flowing into the system. But the caveat is we have to make sure that customers understand what it is and what it's not. The fact that it's only this lump sum of money, that it's not a substitute or a replacement for your typical make me whole insurance policy. So that's from the regulatory point of view. From the incumbent point of view, I mean, again, there's sort of, um, there's two sides of it. One side is seeing the great market opportunity and the financial opportunity to cover these, these gaps and sell more insurance, quite frankly. But the other side of it is um, almost pretty much the same as the regulatory side. What if consumers misunderstand and will that get us into trouble? And should we be willing to take a risk on this new product category of parametric um, versus just sort of doubling down on our, our cash cow of the existing book of business. So the incumbents are taking a wait and see approach um, and letting the startups like Jumpstart uh, take the risk of introducing this new product category. And so for them, it's more of a, a build versus buy question. So I hope that answered your question. Yeah, Nikita, um, please let us know if you just give a sign in the chat, that would be terrific um, about whether that is a satisfactory answer. So I'm going to then, based on that, since you just sort of brought that up, the parametric, um, and yes, thank you, well done. Um, Brent Barnett has a question. Financially speaking, is your product an insurance product or is it a derivative product? <laughs> uh, very advanced question. Thank you for that. Um, so a parametric product could in theory be structured as either one. We have structured it as insurance and there's a reason for that. We specifically are targeting, we want, we want a lot of people. We want this to build equity across a widespread swath of society. We want it to be accessible to many, many consumers at many levels of economic, um, uh, socioeconomic status. Uh, so that's why we chose a product that was a $10,000 payout because it can be bought for $20 per month, which is affordable for many people. But the flip side of that is as in it, we want the payout not to be taxable because to get this money in the aftermath of a disaster and then have to pay 20% tax on it or maybe more um, doesn't feel good. It doesn't seem right. And so it was very critical to us. Uh, to have it be classified as an insurance product for not only the tax reason, but also um, because insurance has so many consumer protections. So in theory, one could structure a parametric product as a financial derivative, but in this case, it didn't make sense. Um, 
And you're right. That point of entry is really important, especially for the folks who are probably most likely to be hit hard based on where their houses are. Just I, I'm thinking of, for instance, in Oakland and Berkeley and Hayward, where the San Andreas Fault is local, locally. It's um, through some of the you know harder neighborhoods. And um, so that's really terrific in terms of making it a much more accessible. I'm going to pause here before we move on to the next question and tell the story from one of our customers. Please. Um, and uh, I think this will really shine a light on it. So um, one of our customers is Molly. She lives in Napa, although she grew up in, um, in North Oakland. And uh, she is, well, she now, she's now 31 years old and she works in the service industry. And uh, she was in Napa at the time of, there was a magnitude six earthquake in 2014. So this is now six years ago. Um, and it was, um, you know, in, it was in the middle of the night on a, between, on a Saturday night at three in the morning on a Sunday morning. And um, so it was enough that those of us in Oakland and Berkeley could like, you know, we felt a little jolt and we woke up and rolled over and was like, okay, that was no big deal. Um, but the central Napa had some level of economic disruption. It wasn't total mass destruction, but there were an old brick buildings where the bricks fell off. There was, um, you know, buildings that got flooded because the sprinklers came on because of the shaking and then it was three in the morning. So by the time the maintenance person got there, there was, you know, hours and hours of, of water. But Molly at the time was working for a, p a local pizzeria that was in one of these old brick buildings that you see in a lot of downtown areas. Um, and that pizzeria had done the right thing. Brick buildings are notoriously dangerous in earthquakes because the bricks can sort of shake loose and then fall. If you get a brick on your head, oof, you're going to be hurting. Um, and uh, so the pizzeria had done the right thing. They had done a seismic retrofit. It's a structural engineering um, task. And you, they put in these steel braces, diagonal braces on the inside so that the, the, the bricks would um, stay intact and not hurt their customers. Um, so then when the earthquake happened, the initial, their, their building initially got a green tag, that means safe to occupy. But very shortly afterward, they got a yellow tag, which means restricted access, and then a red tag um, shortly thereafter, which means do not enter. Um, nobody, not even the owner, can go in or nearby. Why? At no fault of their own. It was because the building next door, which was also brick, had not been retrofitted. The owner had not done the right thing. The parapet, which is the part of the wall that sticks up above the roof, um, was had some bricks loose. And those bricks were in danger in an aftershock of falling through the pizzeria's roof and, um, and hurting the customer. And so the, <laughs> instead of the building next door, the owner of the building next door, then going up to the parapet and just taking down the parapet, they didn't. And so the pizzeria had to build a whole catchment structure on top of their roof, which took them months to build before they could reopen. Oh, and so Lord. Molly didn't have a job for several months. And, um, you know, she got a few things going on with her with a couple of gigs. But nevertheless, she was a um, uh, she experienced the aftermath of this economic, so this macroeconomic disruption, which she had was no fault of her own, it was not related to her personal belongings, and for which $10,000 really would have made a difference uh, to meet her expenses for a few months to, um, to, to, to proceed forward and start the recovery process. Wow, that's amazing. I just, uh, I go back, I think back to the 1989 earthquake. <clears throat> and I know um, in the media business, at least, there were a couple of folks, um, we lost some colleagues because the unreinforced building collapsed completely. Um, and also all the glass blowing out. I mean, there's just so many different aspects that you can't even imagine, especially when you're not used to experiencing something at that, at that level. Um, so, um, yeah. Wow. Well, thank God for you and, and Molly that you have each other. Thank you. So, Shifting into, you know, getting a business started, what refuels you? And then how do you put that to work to refuel your business? Like, how do you take care of yourself and how do you source your own resilience? Mm -hmm. And therefore, how do you, how do you encourage then uh, your team, uh, your customers, your various stakeholders? Um, 
Thank you for asking. And um, you know, it's, it's, it's essentially, it, it doesn't necessarily sound like a personal question, but it's, it's, a, it's a deeply personal question. I'm not, I'm not afraid to go personal as you could, yes. as you could tell. Yeah, from and if it is interview. too, by all means, just, yeah. I, it's so helpful because it's one of the biggest things that as leaders, oh, we, we hold so much and we wanna do it, we wanna do it, but then there comes a time when in order for us, we've got to put our own mask on first before we put it on for others. I was talking to, I, I will answer the question, but I just want to do a, a quick diversion. I was talking to my daughter who's nine. Mm. One of my daughters is nine. And uh, I was talking to her about empathy. And she said, mama, do you think I have good empathy? Because, you know, they talk about social emotional learning in, in, in school, even though it's distance learning. And I said, uh, sweetie, you have beautiful empathy. You have so much empathy. I'm really admire. One of the things I admire most about you is your empathy. And, uh, and then she kind of had this little feel, sense of smile of pride on her face. And, and then I, <laughs> I don't know if this was a mistake or not, but then I said, and you know, the thing about empathy is so sometimes, sometimes you know things about what other people are feeling. You know what they need before they do. And so it comes with a lot of responsibility. And, uh, and she immediately started crying. And she said, yeah, I feel so much responsibility as a nine-year-old, oh, a poor oh, baby. I, I, um, but I totally relate get to it. it because there's this feeling of, oh, there's all this responsibility. There's so much weight on my shoulders. And, yeah. um, and it's, you know, all I can do is sometimes, occasionally, it's all I can do not to feel this sense of despondency. That's why this is a personal question. Um, and uh, And being able to sort of, um, re breathe, find my keel, um, recognize that the responsibility is a gift. I don't need to be despondent. There's, you know, again, cultivating gratitude, like I began this, this conversation. Um, you know, for me, I, um, I love being out there. I love creating change in the world, but, um, I'm, in, intrinsically, I'm an introvert and I recharge mm. by, uh, with time to myself. Mm. I, breathing, meditation, prayer, um, reading, uh, and, you know, I don't, it's hard to get enough of that, um, even in the shelter in place mode, because the, as much as I love my family, we're all in this small house together all the time, and I, I love them, but um, it's, uh, we're on top of each other. Uh, so, and, and the, the second thing about the team and inspiring the team and the stakeholders, the customers, um, you know, coming back to being authentic and tapping into who I, who I truly am and what's truly motivating me instead of trying to sort of gloss over with the, everything is great, everything is awesome um, all the time, <laughs> right, exactly. Um, I think degree, uh, lends a degree of, of, of credibility and authenticity to what we're doing and how we're reaching out to our, to, and partnering with our stakeholders. I, I think one of the things that we all, and perhaps this is, if there are one of the gifts of COVID, um, can learn is, with regards to responsibility and accountability, and when you are an empath, uh, is recognizing which part is yours mm -hmm. and which is actually somebody else's. And then at least what I've taught my daughters, I've got two hyper empaths. And believe me, yours are nine, mine are now 21 and 25. And anyone on <laughs> listening, you know of what I speak. There's peaks and there's very deep valleys and getting to that other side, but also really recognizing, okay, this is where my little, there's a boundary and I can help and I can do what I can do. And then I need to pass it on over to, to, the, to the other person. And you can kind of only do what you can, what you can really do to help them. Absolutely, absolutely. And not taking it all upon oneself because not only is that impossible, but it just sets up, uh, expectations that are unrealistic, not just for yourself, but uh, among the other people on your team. I agree. The entire, the entire ecosystem. Um, so Eric Salva, uh, Salvatierra, love that name, is joining from Seattle. Um, and he wanted to hear some um, frameworks that professionals follow throughout their practices. So are there, are there key you know, are there key processes that you use um, to kind of either decide I'm going to move forward and go down this path with, with this partner 
or what are some of the telltale signs that you turn to to say like what are your red flags or your blue flags? I can think one would be values alignment right out the gate, right? So that probably takes a lot of folks out, but but when you're looking at future partners or potential partners for collaboration, what are you looking for? So for instance, what if, if folks wanted to help or join in and jump in, uh, aside from, you know, yes, obviously purchasing perhaps policies and things like that, but what, what are other ways that folks can work with you and support you and help you? Yeah, that's a great question. Thanks, Eric, for asking it. And thanks, Kate, for adding the context. Um, so Jumpstart is available direct to consumers. So you can go on the internet, search for Jumpstart Insurance, and you'll find us. Uh, if you're in California, you can buy a policy. But also, one of the things, this, this, this first comment is really a response to Eric. Um, one of the things we learned from our customers is their journeys, like mm -hmm. Molly. And one of, the, one of the parts of the journey that we're most interested in is when are people most um, interested in buying Jumpstart or in getting coverage or thinking about protection. Um, and that is data that is informing our strategy. So we're not just shooting from the hip. In terms of processes and decision criteria um, as a business person, we, we use that, that information that we gain from the stories, from the data um, to then focus and make most effective our, our strategies going forward. And so specifically the strategy, now to answer your question, Kate, is um, in terms of partners. So I'm glad you brought that up because not only are we, is Jumpstart available um, directly, but we are also making Jumpstart available through partnerships. And so one ideal partnership is employee benefits. Mm -hmm. So a company who's really committed to building resilience and who has a complete resilience plan, not just disaster recovery, but the elements of resilience, which are financial wellness and um, tapping into those inner resources, making sure that you have recharged, like going back to the previous question, methods of recharging, um, all, all those things, recognizing that the, the wellness of the employees is critical to the resilience of the organization. It only makes sense to have a parametric uh, employee benefit that pays in the aftermath of a natural disaster. Um, another example of potential partners is people moving. When people are moving, they're thinking about, um, okay, how do I, you know, what are the risks? Am I moving closer to the Hayward Fault or farther? Am I moving into a wildfire zone? And they ask these questions, they're attuned, they're sensitive, they're open to these questions of how, what are the best way to prepare my finances given this big shift, literally a shift in my lifestyle. Um, and so partners who are tuned into the customer journey of relocation and moving are ideal partners uh, to work with Jumpstart so that we can improve the customer journey on your side. So that's actually a really interesting point you just brought up because obviously there's a ton of relocation taking place. So what methods are you using to get the words out to, uh, well, I was gonna say other states and other places where people are coming into California. I don't know now, that might be, uh, might be different. Um, but what, what was your thinking prior to all the fires and all of that going on? Like, how were you, how were you getting the word out? Yeah. Um, honestly, it's about being found. Uh, so from the direct to consumer point of view, um, we are a big believer in providing educational, credible content. So that when people are thinking about earthquakes, so that when people ask the question, um, what's the safest place to be in an earthquake? Or what are the three um, considerations for seismic disclosures when I'm buying a house? They, they find us, they find our information and they, they read it, it's valuable, it's helpful. And then they see what we're offering. So being a credible source of just of content that is helpful and that is credible um, builds that sense of trust and transparency that really underlies our values. So really being that resource um, receptacle where people can turn to the kind of, you know, that provides them with the tools that can equip them when they're making some of these decisions. Mm -hmm. So what's on the horizon? Will you, where, what disaster will you, will you counter next? Will it be fire? Will it be, and what's your thinking about that? Like, what's your, 
what do you see out there in your yeah i think i said if i didn't say it earlier i should have that uh, this notion of an if then payout for insurance is really um you know, is a, is a complete mind shift uh, in, in, in how people think about insurance. And by virtue of that, it's effectively a new product category. And um, it could become as commonplace of a consumer product as your HSA or as your 401k. Oh yeah, I have my jumpstart. I have my parametric policy in addition to whatever other earthquake, whatever, <laughs> excuse me, whatever other insurance there is. Um, and so um, that is the grand vision is parametric is a new product category, but the steps to get there, we started with earthquake because we're in California um, and because it's my domain expertise. It was the way I was able to get the foot in the door with the regulator. Um, and it's the way I was able to get the, the door opened at the Lloyd syndicate, who is our reinsurer. But the really big um, opportunity is floods and climate change in general. So building resilience to climate change is a huge potential for parametric, for data-driven, technology-driven financial resilience. Uh, and so, you know, when the time is right, we will work with partners to introduce parametric coverage for their stakeholders, for flooding, for, for sea level rise, um, wildfire when the time is right. It's not quite right just yet um, because there's a lot of uncertainty in the regulations. Um, so that's really the grand vision of parametric as a solution for climate change related risks. And then being a leader. So would you ever um, start offering some of these products and potentials outside of California? Oh, yeah. Thanks for asking. Yeah, our earthquake product will be available in Washington and Oregon um, starting December 1st. So we're very excited. Uh, that is really like very close. Um, and we've been wow. working for about uh, eight months with the regulators as well as our um, the Lloyd Syndicate and uh, to create the the most the most accurate uh, pricing uh, that we can. And you know the 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 price of the of the insurance in Washington Oregon is going to be less than in California because the the probability of an earthquake is less. Risk. But nevertheless, there is the chance of a a really big one in the Pacific Northwest. Yeah, I was thinking that what made me think about that was when you mentioned floods and I'm thinking about Louisiana and I'm thinking about so many, well, I mean, even Florida, because I will say I often thought as a lifetime, fourth generation Bay Area Californian and people would say, how can you live there? The earthquakes. And I thought, okay, once in a blue moon, but every year every there year. have been like breadbasket land floods and decimation. I thought, oh, I think that to me is much, I mean, how can you live there? Uh, but now sadly, <laughs> that's all shifting and we've got our, a whole other set of woe with fires and such. Yeah. And, and just, my brother lives in Iowa and uh, uh, there's been floods of, there's a lot of recent memory of flooding in Iowa. And now also they had the big derecho uh, oh. windstorm. And, you know, he, he's very lucky, but his neighbors not so much. The big tree that came down in their yard literally fell within inches of their roof. Uh, so they, all they had to do was, um, you know, harvest some firewood as opposed to rebuild their house. Yeah, the derecho. And also, I guess what happened to us in California where there was that 50,000 huge inner column of whole new weather system created by all the fires um, is terrifying because now there's, there's new weather, right? And not everybody, <laughs> it's really hard to tell. Everyone's sort of taking a look saying, oh my gosh, I, we've never seen this before. I feel like 2020, yes, it was supposed to be the year of clarity. It's clear that there is so much on the horizons and futures that we don't know and can't see coming. I mean, it's really, it's really quite something I've got to say. So um, I want to just pause there and interrupt you and say that, yes, yeah. there Come is on. more uncertainty now. And, or maybe we're more aware of the uncertainty, but the uncertainty doesn't have to be terrifying. Scary. Uncertainty can be an opportunity to get prepared and to build, build your, your wellness, whether that's your inner wellness or whether it's your financial wellness. I agree. And I think you and I philosophically definitely believe in this is there's a super thin line between fear and excitement. And so when you don't necessarily know what's going on, yeah, you can sit there and come from a scarce a scarcity mentality and be afraid, but that's going to be more likely you're going to be then be stuck in that place and be hit by the terror of which you are afraid of, as opposed to saying, hey, this will be cool. What's going to, how can I learn? 
Because I do think that that is something we are all being called upon um, is in these days moving forward is to enter into life and just coming from a place uh, with beginner's mind and master's heart <laughs> where there's great compassion, but then also just deep, deep curiosity. Um, well said, well said. Thank you. So that the inner resourcefulness comes out. And you share it. Exactly. Because then if we do that, it all starts to, it's, it's, if nothing else, it's less scary for sure. So if you, we'll close now, but I would love to hear what are your pearls for people who are thinking about starting their own business and what are three things you'd encourage them to do? This wasn't on the script, Kate. <laughs> I know, my lady. We're, I think you have great wisdom in you. So no, no. The, for the purpose, for the audience and the listeners out there, there were, we. This is one of the few where there really was no script because Kate and I um, get along so well. There's it's very organic, very natural, very authentic. Um, so, so three three words of wisdom. Um, support system, um, you know, your social connectedness, you know, now more than ever, it's become so apparent to us how critical it is to have um, this social connectedness. In fact, there's some recent research by a, um, an academic at, a professor at Purdue, no, Northeastern University, excuse me, um, named Daniel Aldrich, who mm. shows, very, with a lot, of, a lot of data that shows that the, one of the most important keys to disaster recovery is social connectedness. And he has made a very compelling scientific um, study show after the Tohoku earthquake in, in, and tsunami in Japan and a whole um, suite of other natural disasters showing that social connectedness is so critical to reinforcing that inner, inner resilience and being able to get through the setbacks. So, and that's true of the little things too, like all of the um, difficulties of being a leader and forming a business as the, the social the social connectedness, whether it's your family, your friends, other founders, um, you know, your customers, your teammates. Um, and you asked for three, and I would say that, um, you know, the, the, another really important one is purpose. Why do we get up every day? Why do we, why do we keep doing what we're doing if we're not living a legacy, if we're not living consistently with our values. That's the fundamental reason that we are so excited to be participating in SOCAP because it's this alignment of purpose and alignment of values. And it's what will allow each of us individually and collectively to leave a legacy and leave this world, um, you know, a place where we want our children and our future generations to grow up. So well, I think I'll leave it at that beautifully put and i was i was going to say the fact that you're a b corp there are not many insurance companies that are so i to me to me that speaks volumes across many many different hills and valleys and horizons so uh with that i'm going to say thank you so much kate it has been a delight i look so forward to seeing you make this um parametric insurance movement ignited. And next thing we know, we'll have you back for a follow-up conversation about how you've expanded. And it'll be really terrific to see what you've been able to do. I want to thank everyone for joining us today and asking terrific questions. I think um, to me, you know, one of the key values that we have at SOCAP really is the wisdom of the crowd. And uh, we are nothing without our extraordinary crowd. Speaking of SOCAP, um, if you have not uh, purchased a ticket yet, it is, uh, we start on Monday, really a little bit on Sunday, and we're doing SOCAP very different, differently this year. Uh, one of the things uh, I came in as a leader uh, a couple of years, about, it'll be two years in December, January, was I wanted to reimagine the impact space. I thought it was very siloed. I thought I saw a lot of the same people just giving the same conversations. And there's extraordinary individuals, just like anyone on this call in the UK, doing amazing work. So how can we lift more voices? So to that end, we are actually opening up and have opened up our platform for many of our other fellow conveners who would normally not be able to run their programs and frankly, perhaps shut down. So please join us for a week of impact it is an extraordinary adventure because you will hear from folks like Jumpstart 
and Kate. You'll hear from, I think this year we've got about a hundred different uh, countries gonna, are gonna be represented. We have everything, um, our themes are chosen by our community. So we'll be discussing climate, we'll be discussing arts and culture, future of work, next generation um, of uh, leadership, of course, impact investing, uh, education, mental health. So it's, it'll be a really wonderful experience and it's all gonna be also videoed, much of it will be. So you'll be able to, you know, hit the pieces that you won't be able to go to and, um, out the gate. So I really encourage you to do that. And lastly, I'm gonna ask everyone, please make sure that everyone in your orbit votes. Please. Vote. 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 This is the, the best way we can, you know, we vote with our feet with where we work. We vote with our wallet, what we consume and who, what companies we support. We vote with our heart what we decide um, to support with our financial resources when we're building our portfolios. But really, now more than ever, oh my gosh, we've got to vote so that this world has a chance to really heal itself. And I think um, now more than ever, we're calling on, on everyone. So please have your voice heard and um, make your vote in all those other three areas. And with that, I want to say thank you. We know you have a choice to spend your time um, many different places, and we're just really grateful that you chose to spend it with us this morning. So with that, take care, have a great rest of your week, and hopefully see you at SOCAP. Bye-bye.